Thank you very much. Now we will hand over the dice to uh, Professor Goyal if he's around. Is he yeah, around? Yeah, uh, I think so. Dr. Goyal, are you there? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Yes. Hi, yes, John. Good, good evening, yes. sir. Good evening, Manas. Nice presentation, dear Manas. Thank you, sir. Now this endoscope thing is not, uh, you know, such benign or such easy. We have good, beautiful participation, beautiful presentation. Thank you, sir. I know you don't like endoscopy, but then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, Manas, I have to get you off the screen there, Manas. Your yes. screen share. Okay. I'll get you off. I'll, I'll stop setting. Yeah, I got it. It's, it's, it's okay. Okay. Okay, it's all yours, it's all. Yes, John, are you with me? Yes, yes. So, I'm going to present to you my book of neurosurgery and my life in neurosurgery. I have got three books in my world of neurosurgery. One is on cranial neurosurgery and skull-based neurosurgery. One is craniovertebral junction surgery. And my recent book is on spine surgery. And I really consider my recent work in spine, like work on degenerative spine, lumbar disc, cervical disc, OPLL, I will discuss in my third book with you. So my first book is on cranial neurosurgery. And essentially it is a, you know, because you may not, many people have been asking me to send my list of articles and things like that. So I'm will like to place my some of my papers on record for you to see them later and also try to explain to you some of my work that I have done to give you a right perspective and also try to explain to you what each article of mine has. So this was the book which I had written in the year 1996 and this book I had written with Professor Kobayashi and uh, this book has, I hope you can get hold of this book. This was published by Churchill Livingston. And this was reprinted three times and was quite a popular book during that time. And this book has, the part written by me has completely my own work and it is not a review of literature or things like that. The techniques described in this book are my own personalized techniques. So this presentation of mine also will be quite personalized, giving you my work and I have to tell you that I'm proud of what I am presenting. And I only hope this presentation can stimulate young people. This is a collection of my work over the last 37, 38 years in the subject of neurosurgery. And let me see how you take this work. So in 1996, this was my article, basal extension of temp subtemporal approach, basal extension of craniotomy. I've already shown some of my work in my previous presentations to you. So my basal craniotomy involved resection of the roof of the external ear canal, roof of the condyle, and included mastoidectomy in the exposure. So skull base, you know, skull base surgery was really developing during the, those years. And this, this contribution of mine, which was published in this journal, I have a feeling that quite a beautiful exposure at that time. So we had incorporated mastoidectomy in the subtemporal approach. And this kind of basal exposure was used Middle fossa approach was used for pitoclival tumors and trigeminal neurinomas, and extradural approach to trigeminal neurinomas and pitoclival meningioma. So this was quite an extensively used approach at that time. But I must also tell you over the period of time, I have matured to a different kind of staging, which also I will discuss in my subsequent lectures. So this was the approach 
root of zygoma, roof of the external ear canal, root of roof of the external ear canal, roof of the condyle and partial mastoidectomy. And this was the exposure you can imagine at that time, zygomatic osteotomy and orbital orbital zygomatic osteotomy was quite a common thing in the skull base arena. So I avoided doing mastoid orbital approach and I also avoided doing temporalis muscle elevation on the zygomatic arch. So you see the beautiful, the temporalis muscle was actually elevated and moved anteriorly into the field. So this was also a new technique. And also, you see, this was a new incision which I had described, the incision going back like this, the temporalis muscle which, which goes right up to the parieto-occipital region was rotated anteriorly. And this was the temporal craniotomy that I did. The other, as you know, nowadays I don't do this basal exposure, but I do this splitting of the temporalis muscle. So I do this splitting of the temporalis muscle for tumors like trigeminal neuronomas and also for some tumors like pitoclival meningiomas, which I am coming from the subtemporal approach in the cavernous sinus and things like that. So splitting of the temporalis muscle was the technique that we described. And I think this splitting is a very uh, beautiful kind of exposure it gives. Of course, many people do it now, but this was described by us. So middle fossa approach and its extension were very heavily used in my articles. I described extended lateral subtemporal approach for pitoclival meningiomas in the year Okay, I believe he's frozen. Just hang in there and hold on. He usually comes back pretty quick. Just wait, he'll come back. John, just bear with me. This is working still. Let me oh. see how I can get hold of this. Okay. Just relax. Let the people relax. It's they coffee, coffee it. break. It's coffee break. <laughs> coffee break, short coffee break, and breathing break. Break for small breathing. Okay. So what I am going to show, John, are you able to hear a little bit? Yes, we can hear perfect. So I will talk by the time my internet works, starts, it starts, you know, it takes time. So I'm going to show you the title of my paper and the, what was presented in that paper to give you a summary of my entire 40 years summary in the cranial neurosurgery. I think I will like to use my Mac maybe we can try it. You see, this uh, suddenly goes and comes. I'm more comfortable with this computer, but the problem is the internet is very weak here. Uh, did you? What did you do yesterday? Because yesterday was a pretty good day. Same, same, same internet, same, same internet. You have okay. been taking bearing with me. 
for the last four days, yeah. See, I cannot, I don't know how to use my phone to connect. You want to use that as a modem, you mean, or just, uh, you want to screen share with your, with your iPhone? I, you're not there, are you? I'm a wizard at using the iPhone. So just relax, let them, uh, let people have some coffee break. I think it is coming up. Okay. I think it is coming up. Tomorrow I promise that I will try to see how to solve this issue of internet. Okay. Okay, John? Okay. Now it is coming up, it is, uh, it is showing some positive things on my computer. Okay. John, you are with me now? Yes, we can hear you. Do, do you see the slides? Not yet, not yet. Okay. Tr try again. Okay, just a minute. Okay, now can you hear me, John? We can hear you, yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. John? Yes, we can hear you. John, uh, can you hear me? Yes. John, uh, was there a meeting yesterday also? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Was there any meeting yesterday also on Sunday? Yes. yes. We didn't get any notification, mm -hmm. neither on mail nor on any WhatsApp messaging. Oh, okay. I put it all over the internet, Facebook, everywhere else. Uh, uh, so. Usually, uh, I get a, a link from Either it's on mail or from the WhatsApp messages. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't get an email, because sometimes I get real John. busy, I can't. John. Yeah, go ahead. I. John. Yeah, go ahead. I. I will answer that. Okay. I will answer that. Go ahead. Uh, see, there is a Telegram group which is just now been made, and that telegram group all the details of the talks will be can you silence the other person please somebody is need to be muted john yeah. The telegram details will be shared. Uh, here I will share the telegram details and then, uh, uh, I mean, and the link. See, the site is neurosurgerycoach.org. So if we go to the neurosurgerycoach.org, you will get the telegram details as well. And uh, also all the neurosurgery TV presentations will be there. And we're trying to get the edited videos as well. Um, so that is about the details. And we are planning to continue this even after the lockdown is over. Right, John? Right. What was the topic you discussed yesterday? Yesterday, uh, I believe it was Dr. Goyle and uh, Victor. Victor discussed yesterday uh, the posterior radicular artery or something. Uh, but we can, you get into that telegram group and then we will let you know. Now okay. let Professor Goyle complete his talk. Are you there, Dr. Goyle? Yeah, I also put a link to the YouTube channel where you get all the videos that we do, okay? I'll put that link in the chat.
Dr. Goel, can you hear me? No, no. The slides seem to be working, but not this. Okay, morning. okay. Okay. Now you now now I'm there with you. Okay. 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 Carry, carry on. So I'm sorry, Ipe, and sorry, John, for and the participants for holding you, but I have to give you my life's journey. So please bear with me. It has been a difficult journey. It has not been so easy as you can imagine working from this kind of a situation. So the other article of mine is on cavernous sinus, which I have talked to you the other day, and you will like to see my references in which I have given a number of speculations about the function of the cavernous sinus, location of the eye in the lateral aspect of the head, location of eye in front of the head in a deer, and how the ocularizing the cavernous sinus and the role of cavernous sinus in eye movements and eye health. I can promise you these are some wonderful articles and those who are in philosophy and the field of speculation and the spiritual field, they will like to read some of these articles. The more important thing is many of these articles are quite surgically relevant to determine, to design the philosophy, to design the treatment, some of this information you can get in these articles. So surgery on cavernous sinus has been my lifetime journey and big work on the cavernous sinus surgery. And there are several papers of mine on how to operate on cavernous sinus and how to design surgery on the basis of the arterial displacement, how to identify the pathology of the tumor, as to how the artery is displaced and how it is squeezed and where it is located in the domain of cavernous sinus, whether it is anteriorly dislocated, whether it is posteriorly dislocated. Oh no. Well, unfortunately, let us stop it. Just, just hang in there. Okay, okay, John. okay go ahead, carry on. So I am back here. John? Yes, I can hear it and see it. Yes, yes. So these, this article is uh, relating as to how the how the cavernous sinus carotid artery is displaced and how you can design the surgery. So you will like to read this article of mine, which is one very beautiful article. And also I have mentioned about the meningeal architecture of cavernous sinus, as I have discussed in my previous lecture on cavernous sinus with you. Extradural approach is one approach which we described in the year 1997, it was published, but I have been doing this approach for much before that. And this was the first article in the literature which showed extradural approach to cavernous sinus. And if you have heard my previous presentation, you have heard this several times. Extradural approach to tumors involving cavernous sinus is a very fantastic approach to the tumors. Of course, I will again repeat the contribution of Vinco Dolenz in extradural approach in general and also extradural approach for aneurysms involving cavernous sinus. As you know, in those years, as I mentioned to you, aneurysms of the cavernous sinus were approached quite aggressively by surgery. Dural fistulas involving the cavernous sinus were in, approached very aggressively by surgery. But now as we develop dural fistulas, of course, are completely an endovascular game aneurysms 
several of them are endovascular game we were you know resorting to bypasses on such common uh, operation that was in our field of business but now bypasses are much less frequent but of course all young and old neurosurgeons have to learn those tricks of trade because many uh, there will be many occasions where surgery and bypasses will be required the other beautiful approach that i described for the first time in the literature in my book of neurosurgery was extradural approach to cavernous hemangioma my next presentation tomorrow will be on this subject on cavernous hemangiomas where i will be showing some videos as to how to remove this most benign tumor of the body and the most vascular tumor of the body and this tumor is completely an intracavernous sinus tumor as i mentioned to you the other day it has got extension towards the intercavernous sinus towards the orbit towards the meckel's cave and the dura here is always preserved no matter how big the tumor becomes so it is a sometimes it it becomes big it becomes massive but it does not violate or transgress the dura it is a disciplined tumor benign tumor understanding this anatomical configuration was first described by us in the year 1992 at that time nobody actually knew what is cavernous hemangioma not many papers in the world literature on cavernous hemangioma so this approach of mine for cavernous hemangioma is one of the standard approaches that is now used by all the people in the world who are doing cavernous hemangioma those who want to do cavernous hemangiomas of course i will talk to you on this subject tomorrow trigeminal neurinoma also i have talked to you in my previous lecture it is completely a defined tumor nobody in the world knew what the definition of trigeminal neurinoma is in the year 1990 or 1991 during that time these tumors were completely unapproachable tumors interdural approach we described and then we described that these tumors even the posterior cranial fossa can be interdural the more important thing that we described in this series of mine which was the largest series of trigeminal neurinoma published at that time there were two important contribution in this article is that trigeminal neurinomas arise in the region of meckel cave so this is this was one uh, description in this article the second description which was absolutely fantastic distribution uh, discussion was that trigeminal neurinomas are anatomical tumors that is one they are located in the interdural compartment that is number 2 internal carotid artery is displaced by the tumor it is never in the confines of the tumor venous plexus of the cavernous sinus is displaced by the dome of the tumor and the other important thing that was described is that trigeminal it arises from one fascicle or one nerve root of the trigeminal nerve and the rest of the trigeminal nerve is displaced by the tumor so working within the tumors you can improve the function of trigeminal nerve so this entity that this remo uh, removal of these tumors can lead to improvement of function was never described before this as a series of course there were some isolated case reports but never as series now as i mentioned to you the other day my experience is nearing 300 cases with trigeminal neurinoma this is another beautiful approach that i had described to you the other day knowing the anatomy of the tumor knowing that it is within the dural caves i did this for the first time remove this tumor without doing a craniotomy so removing a complex tumor in the year 1995 without doing a craniotomy was quite an interesting article during that time and i am not saying that this approach is uh, you know tremendous or something like that but it opened the door for the world of neurosurgeons that you don't need a very aggressive exposure like orbitozygomatic osteotomy exposure of the carotid in the neck exposure of the carotid in the cranium you work within the dura work within the dura you don't need to do craniotomy so this was the article first time in the literature that described that there is no need to do a you know extensive exposures for this so i had shown you the other day these kind of tumors and also more importantly i did this tumor 
extending into the posterior cranial fossa, this trigeminal neuronoma, without doing a craniotomy in the temporal brain, only this cranio opening the mechal scape. So this was also, you know, Cushing had said to remove the posterior fossa tumor from the middle fossa will be the end of neurosurgery. If you can do that, that will be the ultimate of neurosurgery. And even al Mufti had written on this, that if you can do from the middle fossa, posterior fossa tumor resection, that will be quite a neurosurgical advance. And that was published as a cover page of neurosurgery. So this was an ultimate where there was no middle fossa, only infratemporal fossa removing the part in the posterior fossa. Then we described extracranial extension of the tumor is also within the confines of the dura. And this, there is the tumor you can work within the dura for V1 division, V2 division, V3 division, interdural approach, transcranial route, reverse skull base approaches. So this was also one, this was the biggest series and this was also very fantastic philosophical paper uh, describing how to remove trigeminal neurinomas which have extracranial extension. Then, of course, I showed you, you see many of these things I have shown you the other day that even oculomotor neurinoma arise within the oculomotor system and they open up the dura and working within the dural confines. This is the oculomotor system. See this beautiful anatomical description by one of my very favorite young men, Dr. Subdeep, who has done this dissection. Open the sub, there is a CSF extension into the oculomotor system like Meckelscape, like internal artery meatus and canal. Similarly, there is a arachnoid cistern in the third nerve. You can, the tumor opens up the dura, you work within the dura, work within the dura. This looks an inter, intracranial tumor, but it is intracranial, all right, but it is in the sub, in the interdural compartment. So this was the first description of interdural oculomotor neuron Neurinoma, we have described two cases. Now we have some more cases. These are extremely rare situation. And if you have to preserve the ocular motor function, the eye movement, you have to, you do not take this as a capsule of the tumor. And if you take it as a capsule of the tumor, you will certainly destroy the third nerve. Work within the dura, work within the dura, dura without coagulating and without coagulating, and you will ultimately remove this tumor and you can save the third nerve function that was described in this article. Similarly, for seventh nerve, we had described for the first time that these tumors arise in the region of geniculate ganglion. And you can use interdural approach for these tumors even when the part located in the posterior cranial fossa is within the confines of the dura. Working within the dura, working within the dura, you can remove these tumors and preserving the course of the seventh nerve and avoiding violation of the tumor capsule. If you think it is a capsule, then you certainly cannot save the seventh nerve function. Avoiding interference with the dura, working within the capsule, working within the dural confines and avoiding working within the region of the facial nerve, you can save the facial nerve function. This was described for the first time in the literature. And then I showed you my most beautiful article about chordomas. Chordomas are bone destructive tumors. They are extradural in location. They displace the internal carotid artery anteriorly. They displace the nerves of the cavernous sinus superiorly and they are located in the interdural, extradural compartment. They are located in the extradural compartment. They, they are bone destroying tumor but soft tissue displacing tumor. That is the beauty of this tumor. They destroy the bone, but they do not have the power to destroy this artery. They only displace the soft tissue. So on the basis of this, that the artery will be displaced on the anterior surface of the tumor, bone will be destroyed and the cranial nerves will be displaced on the dome of the tumor. And these tumors are extradural tumor. We described a beautiful philosophical approach middle fossa subgastrian ganglion approach to clivus chordoma for these kind of tumors, knowing that the artery is displaced anteriorly, the dura is displaced posteriorly, working in this direction, I'm going to show you some videos when I will talk on chordomas. So this was my most beautiful article, and I think this has contribution in the field of chordoma surgery, and you must know 
that during that time in the year 1995, 25 years ago, cordoma surgery was born in the, you know, is no, was not even born. And to do these kind of tumors, people used to do all kind of aggressive kind of exposures and things like that. But many of these tumors, if you know the anatomy of the tumor, you can do a very quick, very quick job on these tumors. Of course, you have to be radical with the resection of the clivus and things like that. So we had described in the middle fossa approach mobilization of these three segments of the facial nerve, two segments, tympanic and the labyrinthine segment, cutting of the GSPN. Now, of course, I do not do much of these exposures and this article of mine was quite highly referred in the literature. So I'm showing you these articles. Some of them I'm repeating so that it goes completely firmly in your mind and also giving you an opportunity to review the literature when it comes. The other beautiful, most fascinating and astounding revolutionary approach to pitocleival meningioma was this article where we described a lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach to these tumors. So this supratentorial, supracerebellar infratentorial approach was described first time by us in this article for pitocleival meningiomas and these tumors were removed and many people in the world are now using this supracerebellar approach. I think this contribution of mine also was quite a fascinating supracerebellar approach. Otherwise, people used to do by pitocectomy, kawase approach, anticlinal resection, and many of these tumors, the whole world is now doing supracerebellar approach or retrosigmoid. Of course, retrosigmoid was first promoted for these tumors by Sami, but we described the supracerebellar approach. This is a most fascinating approach. For foramen magnum meningioma, you, are, you know the world of foramen magnum meningioma, mobilization of the vertebral artery, removal of condyle, removal of the various kinds of extreme lateral approach. Lateral approaches were described and I was the party to when these approaches were described. I was one of the participants in these uh, approaches, but as we developed in the field of foramen magnum, I do this beautiful approach. Now we have done several cases. 20 years ago, I had described this approach. Midline approach, elevate the cerebellum, come laterally, work within the cranial nerve, and many of these tumors located right in front of the brainstem can be removed quite easily, quite quickly, and quite aggressively by this conventional kind of approach. Now I never do for foramen magnum meningioma. Extremely rarely I will do condyle resection or vertebral artery mobilization, which I was doing on a regular basis in the year 1991, 92, 94 during that time. But now I do conventional. So this article of mine was also quite a wonderful article. You must try to read it. Giant pituitary tumors, I have shown you the other day that concepts of giant pituitary tumor now my experience with pituitary tumors is more than 4,500 cases and I do regular microscopic neurosurgery based on my concept that these, no matter how big these tumors become, they have a very defined relationship with the dura. Microadenomas like Cushing disease need to be removed as a nodule. Microadenomas of acromegaly needs to be treated differently. Many of these, you do a beautiful operation. You give new life to this person. You can give new vision to the person. You can cure the acromegaly and you can cure the Cushing disease by a beautiful surgery. So this is one of the most result-oriented operation that you will do in your entire field of neurosurgery. And you must read some of my new beautiful articles on this subject. I told you the other day that my paper on P2T tumor has completely revolutionized the field of P2T surgery. And this concept that the dura will be elevated, diaphragm will be elevated on the dome of P2T tumor has completely revolutionized P2T tumor surgery. Even the relationship within the cavernous sinus, I showed you that lateral wall is never transgressed by the dura. In encasement of the internal carotid artery is the parameter to define P2T tumor surgery encasement of carotid artery. This grading system we describe elevation of the dural roof of cavernous sinus is quite a common event. To know that this was first described by us, even to understand that the dura will be elevated by the tumor, dura will be elevated by the tumor, 
and dura will be elevated on the dome of the tumor this fact has completely revolutionized pituitary tumor surgery whether you use endoscope or whether you use microscope my my strategy is just to remove the anterior wall of the cella break into the tumor debulk the tumor and the entire dome of the diaphragm will ultimately fall into picture within quick time there is no need to do any kind of aggressive exposure i do not use the exposure of planum sphenoidal and tuberculum cellae unless it is badly indicated and unless the whole dome is not following so it is very rare that i will do any extensive exposure my feeling is this concept that the dura is elevated completely revolutionized pituitary tumor surgery it is extremely rare that these arteries will be encased by the tumor and these are grade 4 tumors so this was an article written by my associates diaphragm cellae anatomical and implications of pituitary tumor surgery so this is this facts which i am telling you are very aggressively highlighted in various articles of mine you can go and read the literature and some of these articles which i am showing you here on the picture are from my letters to editor from my book chapters in various books you must read if you want to go in details with what i am trying to tell you fluid in fluid in tumor i showed you that many of time these pituitary tumors have well defined cysts in within the confines it makes your surgery easy but it makes it the these tumors are more prone for recurrences even in i have described fluid level within the spinal neuroentric cyst fluid level with intracranial schwannomas and the same concept i have done described that these tumors can be re removed easily but recurrence rate is very high and consideration of upfront radiation is considered to be one of the option then i described for the epidermoid tumor this was i renamed epidermoid tumor in the cp angle as tentorium based epidermoid tumor my experience with epidermoid tumor is largest experience in the world by far and 96 cases i had described in the year 2006 but now my experience is quite huge and i had described that these tumors are along the tentorium they go into the cp angle system they go into the cerebral medullary cerebral pontine cerebral midbrain system and they go in the supratentorial compartment on a quite a regular basis and supra cerebellar approach is the basis of these approach of these tumors so this was also a wonderful believe me this is a wonderful approach to petro, uh, this kind of epidermoid tumor come in the supra cerebellar remove the cut the petrosal vein and then attack the tumor attack the tumor attack the tumor and then cut the tentorium go supracerebellar go in the middle fossa and remove the middle fossa component and then come back and remove the part in the vicinity of the cranial nerve so these things have been very elaborately discussed in my article i am sure you will like to read these article please my dear young friends you must go and read this article and when you have a cp angle if you use if these tumors were called cp angle epidermoids i like i have renamed them as tentorium based epidermoids and these are a common forms of epidermoid you must read them and this is another article where i wrote about the beauty of the epidermoid tumors and this also was one of the largest series of pineal region epidermoids 24 cases which i had described in the year 2006 and uh, i will really like you young guys to read this article of mine in which was published as an editorial some beautiful basic unbelievable concepts some things are you know you are proud to say and i have told you this presentation of mine will be very personalized concept personalized presentation please don't take my words in an aggressive fashion these are i love some of these articles of mine and i want you to share my love with you and you will really enjoy i can promise you this endodermal cyst was an entity which was not really understood by the world 
and not many cases have been described. We described this as the largest series in the world at that time. Now I will give you my presentation on endodermal cyst one of these days in this month. An endodermal cyst has special features of spread, special extensions, and how much and the special location in front of the brainstem, and how to identify radiologically endodermal cyst. These are like pus kind of a material. You don't have to remove the entire wall. These are completely benign tumor, but you have to remove the entire material within the endodermal cyst. Some of sometimes these cysts can be located in the Elsewhere, but this pre-medullary location is a very common. There are some calcifications within the cyst that are common, and they may simulate presence of vertebral artery or basal artery within the confines, but they are not. They are soft calcification within the confines. They are on T1, they are bright, and on T2, they are dark. So this is these radiological features I will discuss with you on some other occasion, but these endodermal cysts are very fantastic tumors to remove you don't have to have a very big exposure they look dangerous but you just puncture they are pus like material and then you remove the wall sometimes you can remove the entire wall sometimes you may not be able to remove the entire wall but these are beautiful tumor more importantly the result will be fantastic immediately after operation you will give a new life to this person now my experience with these tumors is 37 or 38 cases and I will show you more of this when we go further. But endodermal cyst, you must remember this entity. And these have special radiological features. Tuberculum celli meningioma and uh, anterior meningioma and olfactory groove meningioma. I have talked to you yesterday. This, I have larger series on many of these tumors. So this large, large, when I talk about, you know, this hospital of mine, a public hospital, completely catering to poor people, essentially, they have no, you know, they will have to come to this department of mine, which has a very, very big name in the whole of country. And uh, because uh, of the name of the <coughs> hospital, there is a big referral base. <coughs> and that is the on that pedestal, on that shoulder of my hospital, and uh, I can talk in this language and on this basis of these publications. So I can tell you, young people, you have to publish whatever you see. Cavernous sinus meningiomas, these kind of philosophical things I have talked to you, and surgery on malignant tumors, and what should be your line of thinking when you are dealing with various meningiomas. I showed you this beautiful article as to how to, it is not the imaging, post-operative image that you have removed the tumor that is your, your shield or your, um, or your outcome. The, the thing is how your patient fares and how, you, you, how your patient blesses you, that will be the outcome. Then I have talked to you about C2 neurinomas in the year 2008. My concept was this part of the tumor is intradural and this is interdural. But as I progress in this field, this was the larger series at that time. There was another further 50 cases. So I am talking to you on the basis of my very beautiful experience. In the year 2018, my concept changed that even this part is within the confines of the dura and you cut the dura here and you remove this tumor. Many of these tumors can be removed in very quick time and if possible, I will show you the video in the coming lectures. Colloid cyst is another beautiful, beautiful uh, case for us neurosurgeons. If you, in neurosurgery, some cases are beautifully done. Micro neurosurgery, precise micro neurosurgery has to be done. These colitis, there is only one approach, interhemispheric transcalosal approach, open the, have the potential to retract the brain, have the potential to avoid the hemispheric connecting veins, retract the brain, work with the work by forceps and open the subarachnoid cisterns, enter into the corpus callosum, make a small opening, drain the ventricular fluid, <clears throat> enter 
the ventricle, identify the colloid cyst, puncture the colloid cyst, then hold the cyst and dissect the cyst from the circumference and you remove the cyst. So this was the largest series when I had published in the year 2002. Now, of course, my series is quite large. Nasopharyngeal angiofibromas are another very dangerous tumors. Most vascular tumors, but you must remember that these are benign tumors. These are completely extracranial tumors. They are not only extradural tumors, they are extracranial tumors. I had described this transcranial approach several years ago, but I had told you the other day, now these are extradural tumors. You don't need to do such mid-facial degloving approach is the most beautiful approach for such large tumors. But for smaller tumors, you can do even like a conventional mid-facial, little bit expanded transpinodal approach for smaller tumors, but you can expand the exposure because many of these tumors and how to remove this tumor is a game. It is a game of experience. It is a game of your ability to handle bleeding, ability to understand these tumors. And these tumors, as I mentioned to you, are completely benign tumors and you remove them, you give new life to this, these patients. I have told you that I don't like preoperative embolization for these tumors because I have suffered, three of my patients have suffered visual loss following embolization and if I have to give you this message, I will never do preoperative embolization for these tumors. Have a wide exposure. Mid facial degloving is my route of surgery. Acoustic tumors is one of the most wonderful tumors for neurosurgeons. All of us love to do acoustic tumors. And I have to tell you, I have all of us grow in our neurosurgery by developing the art of tumor resection by developing how to remove, demolish the tumor and preserve the facial nerve. Facial nerve is the absolute, absolute wonderful need to dissect the facial nerve or you can create very, very bad demolition of the face of the person. Now, over as I develop, as I mature in the field of acoustic tumor for the last seven, eight, nine years, I am focusing on preserving of hearing, not preserving, improving hear, hearing in giant and mega giant acoustic tumor. I can tell you, and you must just listen to me. And what I'm saying is even in mega acoustic tumor, you can not only preserve hearing, but you can improve hearing on a consistent basis. I am not saying that I can preserve facial nerve in 100% patient and all, but there are techniques to improve and techniques to learn and we have to just love this technique of removing the acoustic tumor, the art of breaking the tumor, art of avoiding coagulation within the confines of tumor, breaking the tumor, breaking the tumor, demolishing the tumor and then dissecting the tumor from the surrounding, identifying the facial nerve, avoiding the facial nerve dissection, if necessary, and in most cases, it will be necessary in large tumors to leave a small rim of tumor on the facial nerve. I can tell you, gentlemen, removing of the fish, removing of, preserving of the facial nerve is an art. It is a philosophy. It is an absolute philosophy. Small shell of tumor should be always, in almost always, left in mega tumors more than four centimeter or three centimeter. You don't try to dissect the facial nerve of the, of the tumor and that may be the trick. And this article of mine, you must also try to identify this article, is total tumor resection and facial nerve function preservation possible in large mega tumors of acoustic tumors? I will say in majority of cases, you try to leave a small shell of facial nerve and the recurrence rate, as I mentioned, once an acoustic tumor, always an acoustic tumor, you can never cure the tumor. Once a meningioma, always a meningioma, you can never cure the meningioma. What is important is today, what is important for the patient is tomorrow. We don't worry about what will happen after 10 years. Recurrence will be independent of the extent of resection. And in my 40 years of neurosurgery, I can give you this message to young people that, of course, we have to be radical. Of course, we have to be aggressive in our business of neurosurgery. But that does not mean 
in, uh, in our aggression, we demolish the faces and we demolish hearing. We should try to preserve the facial nerve in all cases by leaving a small shell of the tumor. Preservation of eighth nerve is easier. Preservation of the eighth nerve is easier than preservation of the seventh nerve. We have to grow in our understanding and we have to grow in our style of resection of these tumors. AVM is also a wonderful part of my life. AVM is, AVM is a game of handling blood. AVM is the game of controlling bleeding. AVM is game of understanding normal vessels from abnormal vessels. AVM is the game of preserving the brain, preserving of normalcy and resecting. It is the last chapter of neurosurgery as I was mentioning to you. You should not leave this game for others. You should take this game for yourself. This is not, of course, this is not for those who are not confident, not for those who will be not able to control bleedings. But I can tell you, young people sitting in the audience, young people should be, I know all the people sitting as panelists here are not ordinary neurosurgeons. They are sitting on, they could have been enjoying luxuries of other kind, but they are listening to this lecture for a prolonged period and over the last few days. So these are AVM, you must take it for yourself, don't leave it for others. This is a pile AV fistula, and I had published this series. These are relatively simpler to operate. You have to just clip at this point. You don't have to actually remove. I was not knowing at that time. I had removed this completely, but then I realized that these are different entities from regular AVM, and we have to learn how to remove pile AV fistulas. So this was another paper of mine, Transfalcine Approach to Contralateral Hemisphere, I had described in the year 1995. And this paper is also quite heavily cited, and some surgeons like Spetzler and Lawton like this approach very much, and they have uh, done this approach on some occasions. And I had described to remove contralaterally AVMs I showed you the other day to come from this side, get to the feeders, then come from this side, get to the nidus. You can preserve the vein better in that situation. So contralateral approach, trans transfalcine approach of mine, 1995, very heavily cited. This is also one of my very beautiful papers. This was another paper of mine, middle fossa epidermoid tumor, middle fossa. There is no extension into the posterior cranial fossa. I had removed at that time lateral supra posterior fossa approach to middle fossa tumor. So this was the approach I had described. There are some features which show you, tell you that middle fossa is a posterior fossa approach is better for this. Those tricks I will tell you when we discuss about epidermoid tumors and how the epidermoid tumors are associated with pituitary stock with posterior cranial fossa, I will discuss with you, but posterior cranial fossa approach for a middle fossa was first described by us. Subsequently, others have also described posterior cranial fossa approach for cavernomas of the midbrain and cavernomas of the temporal brain. Recently, somebody has described also epilepsy surgery from the posterior fossa approach and supratentorial midline approach has been described for various kinds of lesions that you know. But this paper of mine was the first time posterior fossa approach for middle fossa tumor. Then there are some articles of mine. You can see the references here, some beautiful anatomical work I'm doing. Now you will see my next phase of my approaches for gliomas, which will now soon flood the literature for you, very soon you will see me and my team will work with you for glioma surgery, but this anatomy of mid, anatomy of the brainstem, one of the most beautiful, you must, if you, please, if you believe me, if you like my presentations, you must go and see these two papers, which have some of the most fascinating anatomy of the brainstem. You can see this beautiful dissection, this is just one slide that I'm showing you, but you see this paper in World Neurosurgery recently published. And some of, I can tell you, this anatomy has never been discussed in the history of neurosurgery. And this Pape circuit, you see 
the entire papus circuit of the body has been removed from the body and has been displaced outside, never done in the history of neurosurgery. And some of these anatomical work you must, you must read and see in the literature. This was another approach of mine, orbital cortex approach for tumors, look, AVM located in the ventricle. You elevate and you come open the sylvian fissure, identify the feeding vessel from the subfrontal approach, orbital cortical approach to lesion, lesions in the frontal horn and the, this area you will see some beautiful, fantastic approach based on anatomical understanding of the fiber tracts anatomical understanding of the uncinate tract, anatomical understanding of the IFOF, anatomical understanding of various tracts which you will see in the near future, my articles which will flood the world of glioma surgery, you will see very soon. Then my several articles describing my reconstruction technique of using the vascularized pedicle in 1994, vascularized temporal um, fascia, uh, muscle fascia flap, multiple layer fixation, uh, reconstruction. I described another beautiful layer for the first time in the literature, the subgallial facial layer. And I use the subgallial pericranial facial layer for the reconstruction of the base. You see this middle fossa reconstruction using osteomyoplastic flap we described first time, osteomyoplastic in the year 1994, then basal reconstruction using multiple flaps. So these multiple flaps we have described, about 12 or 13 we have described. I have no hesitation to say that except for midline pericranial vascularized flaps, all the vascularized flaps described in the literature have been described by us, and you will be, you must read some of these flaps described in the literature. Then I have described the use of mucosa in the reconstruction after pituitary surgery. This can be also a useful kind of reconstruction. Then I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I invite you really with great uh, humility. I invite you to read this article, which is not just an article, it is a poetry. It is an article of different kind that you have not read in your lifetime. This is a poetry, poem. It is, it is discussing the beauty and the, the importance of brain abscess in our body. It is showing that brain abscess is a wonderful entity. It is showing that brain abscess is not a pathology, but it is a divine intervention to protect the human body. It is showing how to protect the body and how to treat brain abscess. There are some very fantastic things in these articles. You must read these articles, and I request you to read. Then so there are some wonderful articles on the concept of hydrospelus and that hydrospelus is a natural protective defense mechanism of the body. And I have decided to give you one lecture later in the, on philosophy of brain, philosophy of soft tissues, philosophy of water, philosophy of membranes. In the one of the future lectures, I will be talking to you about that and tumor induced hydrospelus brain edema are not pathological phenomena, but they are natural defense mechanisms of the body. To understand these are very critical. So shunts were regularly done for supracellular tumors, for acoustic tumors, for all kinds of tumors. In my lifetime, we were doing shunts, but I said that preoperative shunts are negative operation. Preoperative shunts for posterior fossa tumors, for supracellular tumors, for thalamic tumors are negative operations. You must read these beautiful articles of mine. And I invite you to go through the journey of my, these articles. And even tumor induced hydrospelus and edema are defense mechanism. Edema is defense mechanism. So I have completely gone and rejected this idea of decompressive craniectomies. If you really ask me, decompressive craniectomy is the last thing I will ever do in my lifetime. I completely condemn decompressive craniectomies, craniectomies for any kind of indications. 
I completely condemn craniectomies for the for head injury related work and for any kind of intracerebral clot related work. I know there will be many controversial. This is a controversial issue for you and for young people. Maybe it is a controversial issue, but I am completely convinced that decompressive craniectomy. I think I will never do in my lifetime. And one of my presentations will discuss why I will not do. Please don't ask me any questions about decompressive craniectomies when you have questions. Please do not ask me. I have given you my point of view. I know you will have some controversy in this, but no way. Shunts, no way. I do not do shunts. In my department, shunts, one or two shunts are done for congenital heart disease failures and equiductal stenosis. Otherwise, shunts are not done in my entire department. So we had described some alternative kind of shunts for cannulation of third. This was endos, third ventriculostomy using a shunt. Equiductoplasty was first described by me. I don't do it now, but it was described by me long time ago in the year 1993. I had described, 1993 means 27 years ago, I had described equiductoplasty and doing shunt from third ventricle and fourth ventricle, this kind of alternative shunt we have described. And recently, we, more recently, we have described use of Teflon sponge for recurrent arachnoid cyst. You introduce a Teflon sponge. And for uh, intraspinal arachnoid cyst, I have described this shunt you might like to do. Please read this article and you might get some wonderful ideas. This aqueductoplasty and third ventriculostomy from below we had described, but I have told you that this is my historical perspective. I don't do it. Advancement of a craniosynostosis. You see this advancement? I had introduced these screws and advanced this gentleman's head. You see the advancement? It is quite aggressively and advanced. You can see in this picture. And this patient had come to me recently. So this technique was described by me long time ago. Plate and screw technique of advancement of supraorbital bar. I don't do too much of this kind of work now, but this was described by me. It is not very popular technique, but this, see this head like a completely sucked head. And now it has gone in front. And this boy has lived quite a wonderful life all these years. Then there are some beautiful, oh my goodness, these are some of my most fantastic papers. You will like to read them. And I wish and I really invite you with all humility, humility and love for all you guys and gentlemen. Neuraxial healing, equalization of neuraxis, eyeing the skull base, muscle, the eternal eco-friendly automobile, integrity, immunity, reactivity, restorativity, bio lessons from brain abscess. These are some of the most beautiful articles that can ever be, you know, in the neurosurgery, we have never discussed about philosophy. We have always been technical, but we have to be human beings. We have to be philosophical and nature loving human being. We have to be God fearing human being. We have to know that there is somebody sitting on our head who will not be happy if we create complications. We have to learn and learn from our complications. We have to be respecting the powers of nature, respecting the power of Dura, respecting the power of water. And I have already told you that one of my lectures will be on philosophy of neurosurgery and how it relates to us neurosurgeons. And this is the stitch which I had described in the year 92, closure with suturing these two ends. Tenting stitches for the scalp. I used tenting stitches for the muscles of spine and all those things. So this is the way I close my wound. And this is the way I will like to close my discussion with you. So this is the chapter, some, ex some extractions from my book of skull base surgery, book of tumor surgery. Then next, I will give you lecture on my book on craniovertebral junction. And then the third lecture will be for you on my book, which is a revolution. You remember this word revolution. And I'm, I have told you that I will present to you a revolution in spine. I am 
telling you again, I will present you a revolution in the treatment of spinal degeneration. How you treat disc, I will present not ordinary technique of resection or something. I am going to, I am going to present to you a revolution in the treatment of uh, lumbar spine, lumbar canal stenosis, degenerative spine, and other things. So that will be my third lecture in books. So three books, you please try to read the book chapters. When you go back, I have just briefly summarized to you my journey in cranial neurosurgery. Thank you very much. Good, Dr. Tolan. Thank you very much for taking the time. And the panel is open. Are you there, right? John, can you uh, remove the screen share from me? Yeah, sure. Is Ipe, are you there? Maybe uh, not. Okay. Uh, hello? We'll, yeah, are you there, right? No? Okay, go ahead. Ask a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Shirag, do you have a question or a comment? Yes. Yeah, I just, I am a very fan of Dr. Atul Gohil, sir, and I just want to know, sir, how to find out all the articles if I want to read in sequence, sir? That is one of the things that I just want to know. No, no, this is a very big, this is a work of 40 years. You cannot read in one minute. No, you sir, no, to... no, I'm just asking, sir. Yes, I'm asking if no, I no. want to read like cavernous sinus from your article first to end, sir, all like sequence. <laughs> how to go ahead, sir? Like... You know, I have given many of my uh, articles on this uh, presentation and they will be on the YouTube. You can yes. get the reference and you can read them. Without. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Can, can, can I ask you a question? Thank you. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, you can. Go ahead. Yes. John, can Thank you unmute uh, some yeah. of these people? Uh, yeah, let me, let me get that. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Atul, for such wonderful uh, lecture. I'm just uh, following you and your resolutions in the neurosurgery. Um, I have two Thank points. You, uh, the, well, about the vitroclival meningioma, do you use a sitting uh, position for uh, the operation? Yes, yes, sitting position. I sitting. will give you one lecture on petroclival meningioma maybe day after tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to talk to you on cavernous hemangiomas of cavernous sinus. Mm -hmm. Day after tomorrow, yeah. probably I'm talking on petroclival meningiomas, so I will be discussing petroclival meningiomas with you day after tomorrow. Yes. I, I, I need you, you, if you, if you don't mind, to concentrate on videos because I think it's still in, uh, very difficult to control the lower part of the vitroclival meningioma when you are going from solar cellar. So we want to learn this from you. We need videos I to will. check for this. So you can, uh, why don't you come and join me in my department? We, we will have wonderful time together. I know. I, I wish this, you know, this, it's Corona time and the war in Syria since 10 years. We met uh, no, last no, year forget. in uh, Belgrad. <laughs> it was the first time I mean, from I, since, yes. I'm telling Maybe. you this war, this war will continue lifetime. Don't worry about the wars, come back. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay, okay. I, I have seen how to get all the articles. If you Google <laughs> Professor Atul Goel, scholarly articles, you'll get most of his articles and the number of citations. Quite a Very huge. Good. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So you must uh, see so, them properly, okay? You must read them, and I'm sure yeah. you will enjoy reading them. Many of these, you will really love them, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. More questions, comments? Let me check here. Let, let me um, let me see the questions you have. You don't you don't see the questions there, right? No, I can see. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, I'll have a general one here. Uh, how do you manage your time as a surgeon and a teacher and researcher and family? How do you manage to do all these together? <laughs> that is a very difficult question. But I don't know if that's a neurosurgeon or not. <laughs> we have to do all these things. 
most important will be the family i will say most important will be how you handle how you if you are happy with your family if you are happy at home you are smiling and laughing loudly with your mouth open at home with your wife with your daughter that is the bottom line of being able to do your work i will say that is the bottom line of being successful is that you be happy with your family and if you are happy they will participate themselves with you and uh, i think that is the trick of trick you be happy at home you spend time with your family and then you will be able to do all that you want to do very good okay, John. yes more comments questions now's your chance uh, Professor Atul, are we going to have the lecture on the philosophy in philosophical questions? In yes, 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 yes. I will give you my philosophy of water. I will give you my philosophy of soft tissues. I will give you my philosophy of flowers. I will give you my philosophy on trees and how we can use that philosophy in our neurosurgery. That will be my one of my lectures very soon. And OK. Comments, questions? Oh, one question. One go question. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hello, hello. Yeah, hi, we can hello. hear you. We can hello. hear you. Yes. Thank you for the yes. great presentation. One of the question, how long did you train by cadaver or, or your, and still your uh, uh, training uh, with cadaver for anatomical? Uh, how long yes. during yes. The, all your practice? This. That is a very, very important question. That is very important thing in our life. You see, we have to work with cadaveric dissections on a very consistent, you know, it is not a game of one day or two day to be able to drill the petrous bone, to be able to dissect the facial nerve, to be able to dissect the various corners of the skull base, to understand cavernous sinus, to understand petrous bone, to understand condyle, to understand the powers of the joint, to understand paranasal sinuses, to understand brain, to understand temporal brain, to understand fiber tracts of the brain, to now we have, as I showed you, my department, we are dealing with uh, understanding of the fibers of the brain stem, fibers of the brain, so white fibers of the brain. Uh, and this will be, as I have told you, will be my next study material and next papers on this will be my next phase of my life which is evolving phase and you will see them very soon so uh, dissection on cadaver and understanding of cadaver is the bottom line of your life as a neurosurgeon anatomy is the key particularly for young people they have to understand the anatomical subtleties very very fantastically if they have to do go beyond a line if they have to go and of course your experience with tumor dissection your how do you remove the tumor how you have how much tumor how many tumors you have removed if you have removed 10 tumors and somebody has removed 100 tumors there will be certainly a difference between the person who has removed 100 tumors and those who have removed 10 tumors you go on learning you go on learning in your life of learning and that process of learning goes on throughout your life and you cannot say I was doing dissection, now I have stopped doing dissection. The dissection, I will also invite you to come to my department and we will do some dissection together, okay? Very good, Thank you. go ahead, go ahead. Somebody had a comment, go ahead, Uday. Like, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Oh, yes, yes, Uday, my friend. Well, how much time do you take, uh, just for my in inquiry, how much time do you take take to do a cordomaser sir don't ask me this question because you know i don't work with time sir uh, i may remove in 10 minutes or under one uh, it doesn't matter i don't want to i for the young people i don't want to stress too much that i remove quickly i remove in half an hour you have seen it you know it you know my style sir, of doing i am amazed by that i will say minutes, you have sir. to under Forty list your OT list is amazing sir you do 14 cases 15 cases on neurosurgery and that too on a single day is something unbelievable unless I got a chance to see your department and I was amazed to see how how work efficient 
and how much uh, i don't know whether my most of my colleagues or friends who are watching may be knowing that professor goel has a waiting list of zero zero patient waiting list and he is one man who has made neurosurgical waiting list as zero because every patient who ever presented by the evening is to be operated on the very next day so that's an amazing sir and uh, i am a die hard fan of you sir thank you sir <laughs> thank you thank you uday thank you best wishes to you you must come more often to my department i will sir i, I will, want sir. you to thank come you. more often and spend some more time with me okay i am i am trying to this thank you sir thank you thank you uday for your hello adnan you have a question or comment Go ahead, Adna. I guess we can't hear you there. Have audio problems. It's okay. Uh, any other comments, questions? We're not hearing that. You can you can text your question, Adna, if you yes, want. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. We can. Hello. Hello. We Hello. can hear you. We can. Go ahead. Uh, Doctor Aitbin Ali from Marrakesh, Morocco. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Professor uh, Atul Gawol, for this uh, fantastic lecture. Oh, I'm proud you. to attend this lecture. My question is about brainstem anatomy, it's especially yes. concept of rhombomeric architecture. Did you study this phenomenon on uh, your in, in laboratory? Thank you. This, uh, you know, I didn't hear your question properly, but you know, this article of ours, not mine, this was work was anatomical dissection was done by my younger colleagues in my department. World Neurosurgery, this was published few months ago in the journal World Neurosurgery. And I will be very happy if you can read this article today. You must open this journal world neurosurgery and brainstem anatomy i can promise you you have never seen this anatomy in your lifetime big so this is the out of the world work and you must please i will request you to please read it thank you thank you very much thank you thank you okay more comments questions I hear someone trying to connect. There you go. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yes, yes. Sir, I am Dr. Sharad Thanvi from Jodhpur. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yes. Yes, sir. I am a regular follower of you, and this is the very nice lecture. And you have, you are, you are giving regular booster doses to us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we will regularly attend your this will go on. Thank you, thank you and this will go on for this till as long as the corona is there i will be there to give this lecture for you in, in every april you will uh, every day every every day yeah well, thank you sir. you're also go out you're also televising with the, some pakistan with uh, salwan right you can you can talk yes, about yes, that because yes. all all your people can come see you you just talk about when what time that is and when it is yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, there are several now. You know what these uh, several Zoom-based uh, presentations going on all over the yeah. I guess you, know, you get confused. Presentations. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but John, your presentation, your uh, reach of your neurosurgical TV is far and wide. I can see that. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other. Uh, you know, your this uh, no other. Zoom-based presentation has such a wide uh, range all over the world. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Gowell, I, I want all people in the neurosurgical community to let me know about their Zoom because I can put their Zoom also on neurosurgical TV. Uh, so they'll get more people to watch their Zoom. As long as, long as it's neurosurgical and education, they're welcome to tell, tell me, hey, Dr. Ben, I want to put my Zoom on your website so more people see it. Uh, okay, okay. So okay, I, okay. I think we're ready to wrap it up, uh, Dr. Goel, and uh, appreciate your time and dedication. And uh, we'll be seeing you tomorrow. And you mentioned you Thank mentioned you, the, you yeah. mentioned your topic. Uh, what is the topic? Cavernous sinus hemangioma. I, 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 
cavernous hemang surgery for cavernous hemangiomas of cavernous sinus. Okay, very good. I will very send good. it to you. Okay? okay, thank you very much, gentlemen and ladies. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.